I grew up in a single parent household. Just me, my sister, and my mom, with my grandpa occasionally lending a hand with parenting duties. And when I was about four or five years old, we were broken into, twice. I didn't know all the details of the whole thing until years later, like I have vague memories of moving apartments and some cops coming over to the house, but I was pretty much kept in the dark until I was old enough to handle what had gone down. For the first break-in, we were all out grocery shopping, so my mom didn't realize anything had happened until we got home. There was an open window, open drawers, the way my grandpa tells it. It's like my mom interrupted them in the middle of doing something and they climbed out of a second floor window as soon as he'd heard us arrive. That, or whoever it was, just didn't care about people knowing he'd been there. The second break-in happened three months later, only this time the guy broke in at nighttime while we were all asleep. I had to get all this from my grandpa because understandably my mom hates talking about it, but the way he tells it, she basically woke up in the middle of the night and sensed a presence in the room with her. Not like a spirit or anything dumb like that, like an actual person. Then when she opened her eyes, there was someone standing next to her bed with something shiny in his hand. She told Grandpa she was literally frozen with terror, couldn't move, couldn't talk, literally petrified in the very sense of the word. Apparently the guy was mumbling something, but Mom couldn't remember exactly what. Then by the time she started begging him not to hurt her, she couldn't hear anything at all. My sister remembers walking into her room, thinking that she was having a nightmare. She asked Mom if she was okay. Mom threw the covers from over her head, saw the guy was gone, then noticed the second floor window was open where the guy had used the same escape route as the first break-in. She put my little sister back to bed. I obviously have no memory of this because I was asleep. She called 911, then she called my grandpa. Grandpa said the cops found faint, muddy footprints all over the house, including in our bedrooms, so he'd obviously taken his time exploring the place before he'd woken my mom up. Only, this guy hadn't just been exploring. He'd been very, very busy, and it actually took us a few days to uncover all the bizarre little things he'd done, things which spoke to just how insane this person really was. The next day, when we noticed that the cat wouldn't touch her milk, Mom poured it out into the sink, thinking that it had gone sour, then got the distinct smell of bleach as she did so. She can't be certain, but she thinks the guy poured bleach into the cat's milk, wanting to kill it. Then, there was the cracked, empty eggs in the fridge. Not like cracked all the way, just little holes in the top with all the yolk and egg white missing. It's possible he just poured them down the sink, but... Grandpa thinks the guy might have been sucking them raw. Not all that scary, I know, just freaky, you know? Mom says some meat was missing from the fridge too, raw meat, but I know Grandpa used to feed our cat from the fridge too, so we can't rule that out. A few days later, Grandpa came over in the evening for some dinner and offered to help prep for garbage day. He says one of the garbage cans spilled right as he got into the driveway complains to my mom about tin cans in the garbage or whatever, and then goes on to clean up and finds what spilt it. Someone, presumably the guy who broke in, had thrown a pair of scissors in the trash, along with a clothing catalog he'd been cutting up. He cut the heads off almost every single motto in that catalog, and the little paper heads were nowhere to be found. My grandpa thinks the guy took them as some kind of trophy, but who knows what he really did with them. Then there was the salt in my mom's work shoes, the knife missing from her knife block in the kitchen, obviously the shiny thing he'd been holding when she woke up to him in her room. Anyways, the cops got plenty of fingerprints, but whoever it was didn't have a record, and other than the muddy boot prints they found, there was nothing much to go on. So to this day, no one's been arrested for it, but my grandpa thinks he knows who it was. Years later... After we moved apartments twice in a bid to avoid the guy, a friend of a distant relative ended up getting locked up in some kind of psychiatric hospital. The guy had become obsessed with Alice in Wonderland, had all the books, multiple copies of them too, and all he ever talked about was the looking glass or Wonderland and all this stuff. It might just be a complete coincidence, but the thing is, that's my mom's name, Alice. She's over the whole thing now, 
It's been more than 20 years since all of that, but I know that if she doesn't like talking about it, even today, it had to have messed her up for a while. I've only ever told two people this story, mainly because I'm scared to, but also because I'm sort of complicit in the whole thing. Sometimes I feel that if I wasn't so cowardly, I'd have just gone to the police and the whole ordeal would have been over in less than 24 hours. But that's obviously not what happened, or I wouldn't even be writing this. By November of last year, the whole lockdown thing had me pretty miserable. I hated being stuck in some crummy little apartment, but after a while I realized this wasn't so much because I hated being stuck indoors, it was more that I just hated the apartment I was living in. So despite it being a terrible time to pack up and move apartments, I decided to look for a new place. I found a place I liked surprisingly quickly and after a thorough virtual viewing that took place over FaceTime, I offered to put down a deposit. The landlady said I could move in on the first day of December, less than a week from the time I was calling her, and that they were just finishing off a few repairs. It sounded totally legitimate, the lady seemed cool, but... When it came to me asking for the contact info of the former tenant just to get an idea of what I was in for, she told me she didn't have any contact details for him. I was like, huh? What? Well, how did you keep in touch with the guy? She got all flustered and gave me some excuses about having a new phone, which I stupidly swallowed whole because I wanted the apartment so badly. Then, like we agreed, I moved in on the 1st of December. Cut to the second week in the apartment. Everything is going awesomely. Electric bills were kind of high, but otherwise, nothing to complain about. And then one night, I'm literally just getting out of the shower when there's a knock at the door. I towel off a little, throw on a robe, walk to the door, and take a look through the people. No one. I see absolutely no one at all. Stupidly, I then open the door and look out into the hallway, and the next thing I know, there's a gun in my face. And holding it, is a dude in a COVID mask. He and his buddies force me back into the apartment and the whole time I'm like, just take what you want. No one has to get hurt here. I'm cool if you're cool. But the weirdest thing happens. While one of the dudes keeps his gun on me, another one of them walks straight into my bedroom, almost like he knew exactly what he was looking for. One of his buddies follows and I see this big old sledgehammer in his hand. I start asking what's going on, but the guy with the gun cuts me off and tells me to shut up so I did. The front door is shut at this point. No one can see what's going on. No one's coming to help me. So I'm scared, but I'm also pretty curious too. That's when I hear these banging sounds coming from the bedroom, sounding exactly like one of them was demolishing some drywall. And as it turns out, that's exactly what they were doing. I hear a few more bangs before one of the guys shouts, yeah boy, there it is, just like you said. The next thing I know... The guys are reappearing with a dusty sports bag in their hands. He unzips it and just sees rolls and rolls of dirty looking dollar bills. Like there had to be at least half a mil there, at least. The guy takes one of the rolls out, drops it on the floor in front of me, then says something like, Get your wall fixed up, bruh, and keep the change. But don't tell no one we've been here. Otherwise we come back, you heard me? I just nod. Then they walk out still wearing their masks, looking as nonchalant as can be. I was shaking way, way harder than I'm comfortable admitting. Let's just leave it at that. But when I picked up the roll of dirty hundreds and counted them out, there was $10,000 just staring me in the face. If you never had that kind of cash money on you, it makes you nervous. But I knew I'd be spending it pretty fast on getting my drywall fixed up, as well as other home improvements. The first being a big deadbolt on my apartment door. Back when I was locked up, I read a pamphlet on creative writing. I remember how it said you have to create sympathy between the reader and the subject. If the reader doesn't somehow like the person they're reading about, if they can't find any redeemable qualities, they won't root for them to succeed. And here's where my story is going to fall down. You see, I am not a nice guy. At least, I wasn't. 
because back in the day I was a career criminal, one who specialized in burglaries, armed robberies, and most pertinent to this story, home invasions. Violent home invasions can be ridiculously profitable and compared to banks, offices, or warehouse spaces, security is minimal. What's more, me and my firm worked here in England, so it's not like we had some pesky Second Amendment to deal with. Yeah, you still had to worry about have-a-go heroes with their baseball bats and kitchen knives, and I can tell you from personal experience that bread knives leave horrific scars. But it's unless you were daft enough to target some rich farmer, you could be safe in the knowledge you wouldn't be bringing a knife to a gunfight. On top of that, we carved out a very specific niche when it came to who we targeted, because the people we'd go for were either those with no legal recourse, drug dealers, loan sharks, dodgy builders firms, anyone who'd have a lot of dirty cash on hand or anything valuable they wouldn't be able to report stolen. But please, don't get into your heads that I was some weird Robin Hood vigilante robbing the filthy rich and giving it away. Yeah, we went after heroin and crack dealers, but we got them at home where their families slept. We threatened their kids, little kids, man. We put knives to their arms and legs, told their dads we'd chop them up into little pieces if they didn't give up the cash or the coke or whatever we were after. Like I said, we were top scumbags. But here's where the incentive to read on comes in because I'm sure many of you will be pleased to hear that we got what was coming to us. In fact, I might not live to see 2022 and to explain why, we have to go all the way back to around early April of 2015 when a very exciting bit of information made its way through the grapevine to us. So, our little firm had four blokes in it. Me, who did the lion's share of the planning, Kev, the driver, Sean, who was basically the muscle, but definitely had his head screwed on too, and Phil, who brought in the jobs, and who was the closest thing we had to a leader. Phil comes down to the pub one day, and we can tell right away he's got something on his mind. He's all smiles, just orders a Red Bull, and when he sits down in the booth, he's practically rubbing his hands with glee. He then tells us that he had a mate that drove minicabs for a living, and over the previous month, he'd gotten five different jobs driving these gorgeous young Eastern European girls out to this big house in Surrey. Clandon Park House, he said its name was. The kind of place you'd call a stately home if it was under the care of the National Trust. But this one wasn't. It was still very much under private ownership and whoever that owner was seemed to be in the business of bringing some very beautiful but very vulnerable young women there. Only, they never seemed to leave as this minicab driver said he never once drove anyone back. He dropped them off but no one, not from his cab firm anyway, went back to pick them up. This really made our ears perk up. Human trafficking rings don't normally keep a lot of cash on hand, as it's all digital these days, but if one was based in some old big mansion type thing, there had to be some stuff in there with a very high resale value if you catch my drift. Phil then told us that he'd asked his mate to keep an ear on the ground, basically to make sure something dodgy wasn't going on before we hit the place, but otherwise told us to be on standby by what could be our biggest job yet. Maybe two or three weeks later, we get two more pieces of info down the tube. Whatever was going on at Clandon Park was definitely something dodgy. The minicab driver had made two more trips there over the past few weeks. One of the girls he gave a lift to was definitely a working girl. You'd think this would be the green light for us. If we hit the place around the same time as one of these little visits, the bloke might think it was linked to the girl. Maybe the gang running her, wanting more than they were owed, and we'd potentially be off the hook. But the second bit of info came with a warning. The minicab driver didn't think we should go ahead with a job, and this is why. The second time he'd driven a girl up, she hadn't been nearly as excited as the rest of them. He'd said in the past the girls knew they were in for a payday, being driven out to a big posh house in the middle of nowhere. Maybe she'd get a tidy tip or something, maybe pinch a set of diamond earrings, maybe a bit of both. But the last one seemed different. When she got into the minicab, she didn't seem happy or excited. She seemed very, very anxious. When the driver tried to make small talk, she wasn't having any of it. 
And then at one point, right as they're doing about 60 miles an hour on a busy motorway, she undoes her belt, opens the back door, and just throws herself out of the car. He phones the ambulance, then circles back around to meet them, and was there when they put her on the trolley and put her in the back, dead as a doornail. He said the whole thing scared the life out of him, said he couldn't stop thinking about what had that girl so scared over her little date up at Clandon. If he had to guess, he'd say something nasty was going on up there, something that might make any potential jobs very, very messy. And we didn't do messy. We did fast, violent, in-and-out jobs. We should have just called the whole thing off, but Phil had his mind made up about the place, and since he told the other lads that we might be able to retire on the proceeds, their minds were made up too. Then, when we got the news of the vault... It was go time. It had looked like we were just going for the jewelry and the antiques, but when some electrician gave up some info in exchange for a few hundred quid, we had a definite target, and it was all hands to the pump. I used to work as a handyman assistant, and prepping for a home invasion was a lot like prepping for one of those jobs. You assemble the tools you need, sort out a van, Make sure everyone knows the job, then you drive out to the desired destination at the desired place and time. It's quiet too. Not like when you're shopping around for a clean shooter, thinking every second person is an undercover copper. I can just pop into B&Q, pick up a sledgehammer and zip ties, and I'll even get a smile from the checkout girl on the way out. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. The jobs on the other hand, not so simple and the one at Clandon Park was the hardest of the lot. The next twist came from when we found out that we'd be going in during the day. If you're thinking home invasion during daylight hours, you must be mad. I thought the exact same thing. I asked Phil if he'd banged his head or something because the idea of hitting the place at bloody lunchtime was just barmy. Phil told me to trust him, that he'd done the recce, or the scouting, and the place was heavy with security at night. Whereas during the day, there was a changeover of guard shifts at exactly 3pm. This was when the guards would be at their sloppiest, which gave us our time to strike. Phil reckoned that we could get in, have the lead fella open the vault for us, and be out again in exactly 12 minutes, with millions in cash, jewelry, and whatever else they had hidden in that thing. I'll have to admit, hearing about the vault turned me right back onto the job. I've been worried about the whole incident with that call girl in the car, but maybe that was just totally unrelated. Maybe the girl was as mad as a box of frogs and was always going to do something like that. Besides, it was all talk of one last job and will be set for life, and, and any of those little doubts in the back of your mind just dematerialized. I suppose I've kept you in suspense long enough at this point. I suppose you all just want to know what happened, what went wrong why I went to prison, and why my life is now in the toilet. Well, it started with the vault. Everything was going perfectly to plan. They obviously didn't expect anyone to actually try and rob the place during the daytime, and the fact that we rolled up right as some gardener bloke turned up to trim the hedges made the help think that we were just part of his crew. She found out pretty quickly how that wasn't the case, when Sean broke her collarbone with one swing of his hammer. We managed to grip the head security bloke, who was right where we wanted him to be during the shift changeover, and although he initially insisted that he couldn't get the vault open, threatening to scoop his eye out with the sharp end of a claw hammer soon had him remembering the code. We were expecting lockboxes full of priceless jewelry, maybe some gold bullion, painting, I don't know, rich people stuff. What we found is something unbelievable. I use the word unbelievable because, out of all the people I've told, only one person has actually believed me to be telling the truth. But it is the truth. When I saw what it was when we opened that door. What we found was a mix between a prison and a hospital. It was completely sterile, with gowned up and masked up nurses screaming when they saw us walk in with our balaclavas and weapons. There was one main room, what looked like a kind of lobby and six smaller cells jutting off from it. We figured that there might be something valuable in the cells, so we went to see what was in there, and I still remember Kev gasping when he saw that it was women. 
They had a woman locked up in each of these little rooms and every single one of them was pregnant. The hospital staff or the wardens, whoever they were, they ran off into another part of the hospital and sealed the door. I doubt we couldn't have gotten the door open, but we weren't really in the mood to try at that point. We realized that there had been a horrible mistake. Yes, there was obviously something valuable in here, but it wasn't anything we could launder or resell. I don't know what exactly what was going on, but you just got this sense that something terrible was happening, and this was confirmed when one of the girls got up out of bed, waddled towards the cell door, which was made of some kind of clear plastic, and began banging on it. I haven't got a clue what language she was speaking, it sounded Eastern European, but God knows which one. We didn't need a translator though, it was blindingly obvious that she wanted us to let her out and it didn't take us long to find some way of letting her out, but it came with a price. To open up the cells, we had to set off the fire alarm, which meant we had to get out of there without grabbing so much as a Krugerrand, but not before Kev walked over to the room the nurses had locked themselves in. It had this little glass panel on it so you could just see inside a bit, but not a lot. Right before we tripped the fire alarm, Kev walks over just to see if there's anything in there worth taking, and all we hear is, Jesus Christ, boys. What in God's name is all that? I remember walking over and peering through the little glass panel. The first thing I saw was all those terrified nurses, but behind them, in all these little see-through plastic pouches, were babies. Not like actually full-grown kids. No. Some of them didn't look all the way grown yet, but you could tell what they were. There was no mistaking it. We then put two and two together, all silently coming to the same rough conclusion as to what was happening in there, and that's when Phil flew into a rage. I knew it was stupid of him to try and rescue that pregnant girl. We were the bad guys. You don't do stuff like that when you're a bad guy. It gets you caught. It gets you killed. But what was I going to do? Make him leave her? Phil was about a foot taller than me, so generally speaking, whenever Phil wanted to do something, it got done. On the way out to the van, Sean stopped near these big long curtains. Phil just about tore his head off asking him what in God's name he was thinking but later, when he saw him pulling out a lighter and set fire to a dusty pair of drapes, he said he just smiled in approval. We piled into the van just before four in the afternoon and I remember that clearly because of the little digi clock on the dashboard. As Kev turned the van around I saw smoke coming up from one of the windows and I remember hoping the place burned to the ground. We drove so fast that I think we were almost back in London before we saw a fire engine zooming past us going the other way, and thankfully, that was the only time we saw blue flashing lights behind us. The pregnant girl apparently didn't know a bit of English, and was crying and saying thank you, thank you over and over again as we drove back. She didn't know much though, only enough to repeat the phrase, Tottenham Court Road, when we asked her where she lived. We dropped her off, all went our separate ways. Kev got rid of the van, and apparently, that was that. We never had a visit from the coppers with the big key. It took us ages for word of the fire to reach the airwaves, and for all intent and purposes, the raid never bloody happened in the first place. Only, we couldn't forget about it, or rather, Kev wouldn't let us. The prick wouldn't shut up about it, worrying about the girls, wanting to try to find the one we'd saved or call in some anonymous tip to the police. And I'm perfectly sure he did too, calling a tip I mean. He never told us he did, but I know, because Kev was the first one to turn up dead. They said he topped himself, but anyone who knew Kev knew he wasn't like that. He didn't leave a note, he didn't tell anyone he was depressed or anything. Phil was next, or rather, if they did get him, his body was never found. Told me he was going to work in Birmingham with another crew or some job he'd heard about, and that was the last time I spoke to him. His phone was disconnected about a week or so after he got the train up there. I hope he's alright, but part of me knows that he's gone now. I turned myself into the police when they found Sean. Someone had broken into his flat and beat him to death. Sean. Big six foot something Sean, amateur boxer Sean, they'd smashed him to the point where he was unrecognizable. 
If Sean wasn't safe, neither was I. When I first tried to confess to having started the fire, the police told me I had to have been mistaken. Clannon Park had told them that it was an electrical fault in the basement that started the fire, so they basically refused to arrest me for it. I had to tell them almost everything to get them to believe me, even gave them a rough idea of the van's reg number so they could track it with motorway CCTV. Clannon Park didn't want to press charges, apparently. Not until the police wanted to search the property, then, all of a sudden, they were fine with me taking the blame for it. Funny that, isn't it? What I also find funny is how none of it ever appeared in the paper. In fact, on their website it still says that they had a fire in 2015 and that it was an electrical fault, not an arson attack. But I know what happened. No one believes me, but I know what happened. I got nine years for arson, with a few other convictions tagged onto it, damaging a grade two listed building and whatnot. But there was a chance I'd be out in six. I know they tried to have me killed in jail, whoever they are. Some kid appeared on E-Wing around Easter of 2017. No one knew him. No one knew what he was in for. Couldn't have been any older than 18 or 19. Kid tried to shank me up with the sharpened end of a toothbrush. The screws couldn't figure out why. I'd have told them if I thought that they'd have believed me. The kid was found dead in his cell not long after. Made a new set of a jumper and just did himself in. After that, I knew they wouldn't have another go until I was out, and I just kept my head down and did my time. Now here I am. I've been out of the nick for a few months now, reading a bed sit and, well, it'd be silly to give that away now, wouldn't it? I've been in touch with the journalist from The Guardian. I tried others, but no one else believed me. If anything happens, this bloke has all the info, and if they make a move on me, he promised to drop the lot of it onto his boss's desk. But all we can do now is wait. Yeah, we'll keep digging for info, keep trying to prove the unprovable, but I know they're closing in on me. I know they can't allow me to live, because to whoever is responsible for the horror show under Clandon Park House, a few more bodies are nothing to them. In the summer of 2007, the Petit family of Cheshire, Connecticut, consisted of Dr. William Petit, his 48-year-old wife Jennifer, and their two daughters, 17-year-old Haley and 11-year-old Michaela. William Petit was an endocrinologist over in nearby Plainville, and he was also the medical director of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center at Connecticut Central Hospital. While Jennifer was a nurse and co-director of the health center at Cheshire Academy, a private boarding school in their hometown of Cheshire. They had met at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in the mid-80s while she was an oncology nurse and he was a third-year medical student and were married shortly after. The Petit's elder daughter Haley was born just four years later and would grow up to study medicine at Dartmouth College. During her teenage years, Haley had been an active fundraiser for multiple sclerosis research following her mother's own MS diagnosis. Little sister Michaela was born in 1995 and was said to have enjoyed cooking for her family when she wasn't studying at the Chase Collegian School. The Petites were the very picture of a happy, hard-working, upper-middle-class family who had everything to look forward to. But July of that same year, two men would have an irreparable impact on their lives and turn just one or two pre-dawn hours into a waking nightmare. On the evening of Sunday, July 22nd, 2007, Jennifer and young Michaela drove down to a local stop and shop to pick up some groceries for that evening's dinner. It was during this grocery run Jennifer noticed that she and her daughter had drawn the attention of a man in his late 20s, one with dark eyes, dark hair, and patchy facial hair. The man appeared to have followed them through the aisles for a while, keeping his distance but maintaining his presence. Jennifer Petit grew anxious throwing a few items into her cart and then heading for the cashier as quickly as she could. The feeling of anxiety only abated when she and her daughter were safely back in their car. But although she couldn't see it, Jennifer was being followed. She believed she'd be safe once she was back at home, but in reality, her nightmare would only just be beginning. The man who'd followed her home was 
27-year-old Joshua Komazarjewski, and when he slowed to a stop outside the Petite family home, he pulled out his phone and began to text a friend. I'm chomping at the bit to get started, he wrote. We still on? His friend, 44-year-old Steve Hayes, replied. Yes, soon. Hold your horses, Josh wrote back. Dude, Steve replied. The horses want to get loose. After the next few hours, the Petite family went about their evening as planned. Michaela helped her mom cook up a delicious, wholesome dinner. The family convened to eat, then each went their separate ways for the evening, entertaining themselves until bedtime. However, William Petite, the family patriarch, was something of a weekend night owl and often stayed up late watching TV until he fell asleep on the couch downstairs. This is exactly what he did on the night of July 22nd, too, which meant that when Joshua Komazarjewski and Steve Hayes broke into the ground floor of the Petite family home, Williams was the first sleeping body they came across. Josh immediately attacked him on sight, striking him four or five times with a baseball bat before binding his wrists and ankles with zip ties and rope. William later stated that he remembered one of the men telling the others, if he moves, put two bullets in him. Josh and Steve then moved from room to room, rounding up Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela before binding them in turn. Then each had a pillowcase placed over their head in order to obscure their vision. After the petites were properly restrained, Josh and Steve began to ransack the house, taking everything of value that wasn't nailed down. After taking William to the basement and tying him to a support pole, Josh and Steve continued to violently toss the family home in the hopes of finding additional jewelry or cash, and it quickly became obvious to the family that neither man was satisfied with their loot. They had apparently stolen $15,000 worth of goods, but they knew the petites could get them more. It was all a matter of patience and careful planning. At this point, we know that Steve Hayes left the house, leaving the family under the guard of Josh Komazarjewski. He drove to a nearby gas station, purchased $10 worth of gasoline, and drove back to the petite house, where he then forced Jennifer to accompany him to a local bank. This is how the two criminals got their 15 grand, but not before Jennifer subtly alerted the bank teller to her terrifying predicament. This bank teller then contacted the Cheshire Police Department who had officers setting up a silent perimeter around the house before she and Hayes had even arrived home again. Yet when they did, Steve Hayes realized he should have never have left his partner alone with the girls. After once again restraining Jennifer, Steve Hayes walked into the upstairs bedroom to find 17-year-old Haley Petite in floods of tears, while 11-year-old Michaela lay catatonic on the floor nearby. When he asked Josh what he'd done, he unapologetically admitted to having assaulted her, all in the presence of a restrained older sister. Even for a hardened criminal, Hayes later admitted to being horrified by what his partner had done, but in reality it was more of an inconvenience. Hayes grabbed a bottle of bleach, angrily commanding Josh to get rid of any biological evidence he may have left behind, but while he continued to berate his partner, Josh turned around and accused him of being a homosexual. Hayes denied it, arguing that Josh had simply overcomplicated the situation, but Josh insisted, repeatedly accusing Hayes of being attracted to men. So then, in order to prove his partner wrong, Hayes dragged Jennifer Petit into another room and assaulted her, all just to prove a point. Jennifer screamed a blood-curdling scream as she tried and failed to fight her attacker off. Her husband, William, tried to shout up some encouragement from downstairs willing her to hang on just a little bit longer. That's when he heard one of the invaders say, Don't worry, it's all going to be over in a couple of minutes. William later said he realized that this indicated that they were going to be executed, that he experienced a jolt of adrenaline that enabled him to escape his bindings and flee the house. He later told a courtroom that, I thought, it's now or never because in my mind at that moment, I thought they were going to shoot all of us. Hayes was still assaulting Jennifer Petit when Josh walked in to tell him that William had somehow escaped. Hayes was furious, immediately murdering Jennifer by strangulation, before rushing out to his truck to retrieve the gasoline he'd purchased. Haley and Michaela were still upstairs, 
both tied to a king-size bed in the master bedroom, and we can only imagine their horror when they realize that Steve Hayes was dousing their entire family home in gasoline. Maybe they smelled the distinct petroleum smell before he ever appeared, but Hayes burst into the bedroom and began to pour that very same gasoline onto their clothing, their skin, and their hair. I can't imagine that there were words to even describe that level of fear, dread, and horror. When he was done saturating the house, and with callous indifference in his heart, Steve Hayes struck a match, and then set the home ablaze. As the home burned around her, 17-year-old Haley managed to break out of her restraints and run out into an upstairs hallway. However, she was almost immediately overcome by smoke, collapsing and dying in the hallway. Michaela's body was still tied to the bed and an autopsy indicated that her burns may have started while she was still alive. As we mentioned, their father was about to escape the house and he limped over to a neighbor's yard for help. His injuries were so grievous that despite living next to him for years, his neighbor didn't recognize William at first and had to wait for a verbal confirmation before he ran to call the cops. Meanwhile, as the house burned, Josh and Steve escaped in the Petite family car, but crashed shortly afterward, allowing the police to catch and arrest them. In the police interviews that followed, both Josh and Steve confessed to the murders. Detectives noted that Hayes reeked of gasoline during his interview and tried to pin almost everything on Josh, clearly still angry that his negligence had allowed William Petit to escape. Josh, on the other hand, openly called William a coward and told detectives that he could have saved his family if he wanted to. But who exactly were these pair of remorseless psychopaths who seemed to have no problem escalating a simple robbery into an assault and live cremation? Stephen J. Hayes, born May 30th of 1963 in Homestead, Florida, received his first adult conviction at age 16. Between then and the time of his arrest in 2007, Hayes was arrested over 30 times mostly for small-time robberies such as smashing a car window to steal a lady's purse. It's clear that he was a career criminal and that he committed some horrendous crimes during his tenure, but compared to his partner, Steve Hayes was a veritable Boy Scout. Born on August 10th of 1980, Joshua A. Komazarjewski was born to a teen mother who was unable to care for him. After being placed in an adoption center, Joshua is taken into the care of Benedict Komazarjewski, the son of theatrical director Theodore Komazarjewski and dancer Ernestine Stodel. He was a mostly quiet and well-behaved child, but by age 12, Josh began to display the rather horrifying symptoms of a dark and destructive mental illness, best illustrated in an instance in which Joshua's sister accused him of touching her. At the penalty phase of his trial, Josh's adopter's father would publicly admit that this was true, and that Josh had been struggling with predatory inclinations from a very young age. Josh committed his first burglary when he was just 14 years old, and by 2002, he was arrested for almost 20 separate home invasions. It was around this time that Josh told his defense attorney that after robbing the house, he would go to the rooms where the occupants were sleeping and listen to them breathe adding that he did so because he enjoyed the feeling of invading people's homes and violating their security. He spent five years in prison for his crimes, eventually being paroled in April of 2007, just a few weeks from the petite home invasion. After being paroled, Komazar Jevsky stayed at what was known as the Silliman Halfway House, and this is where he and Steve Hayes first met. Following their trials in 2010 and 2011 respectively, both Josh and Steve were sentenced to death for their crimes. Both sentences would eventually be reduced to life terms after some unconnected political wrangling, but even so, both men sought ways to make their punishments easier to bear. On August 18th of 2016, after being transferred to another prison for his safety, Josh Komazarjewski attempted to hang himself in the prison transport vehicle. He was unsuccessful and has since been placed on an almost permanent watch by the state correctional institution he currently resides at. Steve Hayes, on the other hand, declared himself to be a transgender woman on October of 2019. He is currently undergoing hormone therapy as part of his transition into a woman, and 
and it has been strongly suggested by correctional staff that he will seek to be transferred to a female correctional facility once that transition has been completed. It's clear that while one man sought to end his own life, the other wishes to begin a new one. Perhaps Steve Haves really does just wish to be a new person, one unburdened by the sin of his assault and murder. He'll get a second karmic roll of the dice, a new shot at life, but that's far more than we can say for the Petite family and its sole survivor, William. For William has always been haunted by what happened that night, and by his own admission, has never been able to get over it. Yet as he languishes in the eternal agony of pointless and violent loss, the men who killed his family simply carry on trying to forget, trying to move on, but there will always be blood on their hands. In December of the year 2000, two brothers by the names of Reginald and Jonathan Carr arrived in the largest city in the state of Kansas, Wichita. The pair hailed from Dodge City, over 150 miles to the west, and each had an extensive criminal record by the time they took their trip to Wichita. But their visit wasn't in good faith. It wasn't some road trip to sample the delights of another big city. Their reasons for being in Wichita were the very definition of malicious and predatory and it wasn't long before they decided to commence their malevolent mission. On December 8th, Wichita State University baseball player Andrew Schreiber stopped at a convenience store to buy some Skull chewing tobacco. Out of nowhere, the Carr brothers appeared behind him as he was returning to his car and forced him at gunpoint to withdraw money from ATMs until his card refused more transactions. Schreiber was fortunate enough to escape the encounter with just shot out tires, a few scrapes and bruises, and a depleted bank account, but others wouldn't be so lucky. Apart from a vague description of two male African Americans in their early to mid-twenties, police had nothing on which to base an investigation, and all was quiet for the few days that followed. Then, just three days later on December 11th, they invaded the home of 55-year-old cellist and librarian Anne Walenta. The brothers subjected her to much of the same treatment as Schreiber, beating her, robbing her, and taking their time while doing so. However, it appears the brothers underestimated Walenta, and she managed to escape from them, rushing to her car in an attempt to flee the scene. Tragically, one of the Carr brothers noticed her absence, following her outside before sending three bullets smashing through her windshield and into her torso. Knowing they were compromised, the cars took their turn to abscond from the house, while Anne Walenta would pass away from her wounds in a Wichita hospital bed just three days later. The car's crime spree was already horrifying in both scope and scale, but it wasn't until December 14th that the brothers would escalate their frenzy from a series of bloody robberies to theatrical levels of pain and suffering. On the night in question, the brothers pulled up outside a house at 12727 East Birchwood Drive in the Wichita suburb of Andover, which they later admitted to choosing at random. Inside were financial director Brad Haka, preschool teacher Heather Mueller, financial analyst turned priest Aaron Sander, local high school teacher Jason Beffert, and his girlfriend, a teacher known only in court documents as Holly G. The Carr brothers got out of their car, armed with golf clubs and pistols, and walked up to the front door of the home. One brother hid from view as the other knocked the house, smiling and waving when he saw movement through a front-facing window. But when the door was open, the brother dropped his friendly facade, pointing his pistol in their victim's face before forcing his way inside. Once all five of the home's occupants had been corralled into one of the home's back rooms, the Carr brothers began to pillage their belongings. At one point, one of the brothers opened up a popcorn tin, emptying its contents and observing a small jewelry box that fell out. When he opened it, he found a diamond engagement ring, but instead of simply pocketing the ring and moving on, the brothers found the discovery to be highly amusing. They marched back into the room in which they detained the home's occupants and demanded to know who the ring belonged to. That's how Holly G found out that high school teacher Jason Befford was planning on proposing to her, not in a moment of joyous surprise, as it was intended to be, but in a moment of absolute dread and terror, 
as two strange men laughed in her face about it. Even with the diamond ring and a variety of expensive electricals, the Carr brothers were unhappy with their haul. It was then the brothers decided to take three of their prisoners to a series of local ATM machines, forcing each of them in turn to max out their cash withdrawals. This bagged the brothers an additional $2,000, but still, they weren't satisfied. They drove their prisoners back home and then tied them up again, but instead of fleeing the scene with the cash and valuables they'd already collected, the Carr brothers decided to have a little fun. They began to torture the male prisoners from the group, beating with their golf clubs along with a variety of household items. According to court documents, it's then apparent that one of the Carr brothers remembered how one of their prisoners was engaged to another and decided on a horrifically cruel form of torture involving both of them. One of the brothers dragged Jason Beffert into a position where he could witness the violation of his fiancée. The other picked his own female victim and proceeded to do the same to her. This horrendous torture and abuse went on for more than an hour, with the brothers taking turns to beat and violate each one of their terrified prisoners. When they grew bored of the violence, they packed their prisoners into one of their own cars and drove them out to the striker soccer complex on the outskirts of Wichita. As it was late at night, the complex was completely abandoned, and there was no one to stop the brothers from forcing their prisoners from the vehicle and marching them out into one of the soccer fields. They were lined up, forced to kneel, then each of them was shot execution style right in the back of the head before one of the Carr brothers drove over them in the truck they'd been driving. It's chilling to note that this obviously wasn't to finish them off, so to speak. They'd already shot their victims in the head. Running them over in a truck was evidently an attempt to mutilate the bodies as best they could before they fled the site of the murders. Yet amazingly, the Carr brothers didn't attempt to flee Wichita following such a shockingly violent crime. In fact, they didn't even leave the neighborhood. They drove straight back to the home of the victims they'd left lying in the snow and began to utterly destroy the place with their golf clubs. It was then that they found Holly's pet dog, Nikki, who had been so scared during the attack that she'd ran and hid under a kitchen cabinet. One of the Carr brothers enticed the dog towards him with some cold cuts taken from the home's refrigerator. When approached, he smashed it to a pulp with the golf club he was holding. Only when the home had been utterly ransacked did the Carr brothers even think to depart, but they did so safe in the knowledge that any potential witnesses had been silenced, and that in all likelihood they would never have to answer for their crimes but they were wrong. Back at the striker soccer complex, blood-soaked, tire-tracked bodies lay motionless in the snow. All except one. Holly G., though bruised and bloodied and battered, slowly began to open her eyes. She couldn't remember how she got into that snow-covered soccer field, nor did she recognize the bodies of the people lying next to her. All she knew was that she needed to find her boyfriend. She needed to find Jason and that's how she ended up walking almost a mile in the freezing Wichita night, half-naked, bleeding and terrified, but still alive. Around a half hour later, a middle-aged couple were awakened by someone pounding at their door. It was 25-year-old Holly G., bleeding and half-frozen, and according to the homeowner, she apparently opened with, I need to tell you my story before I die. Miraculously, Holly G. survived the attack and would go on to positively identify both brothers using prior mugshots. Both were tracked down the day after the home invasion and were taken into custody following a long and volatile standoff with police. The local district attorney said that based on the evidence, the motive for the murders was robbery, yet he didn't seem to take into account that neither brothers seemed satisfied, even when they killed their victims. He failed to touch on how they returned to the house not to erase any potential evidence, but to continue to destroy all they found. Regardless, thanks to Holly G's testimony, both brothers were convicted of nearly all 113 counts against them, including kidnapping, robbery, four counts of capital murder, and one count of first-degree murder. They were each sentenced to death for the capital murders as well as life in prison, with decades to serve before eligible for parole. Following their imprisonment, Sensationalized news coverage of the Carr brothers' vicious crime spree created widespread panic in the greater Wichita area, 
resulting in a huge spike in the sales of firearms and state-of-the-art home security systems. The fact is, we live in a time when these kinds of crimes are relatively rare. Over the past few decades, violent crime has actually decreased in the Western world, whereas the reporting of it has increased in volume and intensity. It gives us the false impression that things are getting worse when in reality, data might suggest the very opposite. But it's also very true that we can never truly eliminate the dangers that lurk out there in the dark. There will always be monsters. There will always be evil. And sadly, there will always be innocent victims. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... <laughs>